for the glory of old state, for her founder strong and great, for the future that we wait. Praise the song, praise the song. Where else would you rather be? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. Welcome to the people of Penn State. Each week on the podcast, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about, and you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. The People of Penn State podcast can be found on Apple Podcasts or your podcast app of choice. Subscribe and give us a rating. Ratings and reviews help others find these great stories. And we have another great story to pass along to you today. Joining us is Mark Kramer. Mark is a serial entrepreneur, founding or co-founding more than 27 companies. He's the author of six books. He's the host of a global podcast with listeners in 62 countries. The best business minds and national columnist for American City Business Journals. He created the Penn State Technology Development Center, Pennsylvania Private Investors Group, Private Investors Forum, um, the first formally organized investor angel network and the commercial deposit insurance in this, uh, agency. Um, he created a, a first cyber bank insurance policy and the first bank focused on funding technologies company called Tech Bank. Mark taught 10 years at the Wharton School of Business. And in 1991, he was named Inc. Magazine's Entrepre Entrepreneur of the Year. I'm excited to welcome Mark Kramer to the people of Penn State. Mark, how are you today? Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much uh, for having me on your show. Let's start uh, with the question, how did you become a Nittany Lion? Well, uh, I got hired uh, to start the Penn State Technology Development Center, and, and that's kind of an interesting story in itself. I uh, had run a mom and pop mall, and I sent my resume, and I clipped three stories to it. Dr. Larry Cody was uh, the head of the campus at King of Prussia that was moving to Great Valley. And uh, I had sent my resume and actually Larry took my resume because I didn't have a master's and threw it on a pile on the side. His wife walked by the pile while my resume was at the top and said, hey, I've seen what this guy could do. You should interview him. That's how I got my interview with Penn State. If she had walked by after we threw the next uh, resume on top, you wouldn't be talking to me uh, today. So I was very fortunate. I interviewed, I had a vision for what I would do. Uh, at that time it was in a cafeteria auditorium. Uh, he hired me and then he told me, you know, that you're required to get a graduate degree to do this job. What do you want to do? You talked about going to law school or you can get a master's in management in our new executive, uh, masters of management program where you can do it in two years you have to tell me now, which one is it? So I said, I guess the shorter walk down the hall is probably the best way to go and I'm assured of getting in. So I said, smart choice. And I have to say it was the best choice I could possibly have made because when I started the Penn State Technology Development Center, we had literally nothing. We were in a cafeteria and then we were moving uh, to this new space at Great Valley. And I actually reached out to Penn State alumni and accounting firms, law firms, Every single person got back to me quickly because they have this great love for Penn State. And I felt like I really made a good decision. It wasn't just people showing up at football games, that there's really this huge uh, Nittany Lion family. And these folks um, outfitted the entire center. They provide accounting services, law services, introductions, everything. And so I was so proud to become Part of it and the year i won entrepreneur of the year was the year i graduated the very first uh class of the masters of management program at that time you had to write a master's thesis and then they changed it because it was hard for people to do but i was a writer so it was easy let's um let let's take a step back there though and talk about pursuing your penn state degree while while being a, an entrepreneur, while also running the Technology Development Center, right? I, I got my Penn State degree in 2020, um, pursued it as a, as a working professional. What was that like for you when you were going through that? 
Well, I, I, fortunately, I was re working right on campus, so that was great. But my wife uh, was having our first child, and she had a rough pregnancy, so I was back and forth to hospitals every day. And it was the first time that they were doing a part-time master's all year round. So you had to go to school literally all year round with essentially no breaks for uh, two years. And I have to say, it turned out to be a great experience because the faculty was amazing. They recruited excellent faculty. Like one of my faculty members was a partner at Cooper's and Libran at the time, and his name was Brad Allen. And he taught about acquisitions and he actually did acquisition. So that was really cool to have a professor who did that. And we had great faculty that had a lot of real world experience. And they also brought great speakers in to do it. And so uh, that made the whole experience amazing. And then I had really made uh, a great diverse uh, classmates. Now out of 122 that started with us, there were only maybe five of us that wanted to be entrepreneurs. And truthfully, uh, I never really wanted to be an entrepreneur. My grandfather was a business owner, my dad was. And I, I looked at the number of hours they worked, which were insane. And I said, I never want to do that, but here I am. And that's what I became. This is the people of Penn State. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by Mark Kramer. He's the president of the Best Business Minds. So Mark, before you became a Penn Stater, you grew up in the greater Philadelphia area, decided to go to West Virginia uh, to pursue a degree in journalism. First of all, why West Virginia? What was the draw to Morgantown? Well, to be truth be told, they had a great journalism school and they were the only school that accepted me main campus. So I went out there. Frankly, I didn't even know West Virginia was a state uh, when I went out there. But I have to say I fell in love uh, with the campus and the people and they were certainly nice, but it didn't have the same uh, power and cachet that Penn State had. Now, my dad had went two years to Penn State and had transferred um, because uh, of the family business needed him. So he ended up transferring to Temple. But my dad was through and through Penn State. I mean, I knew everything about Penn State football. My dad was dying for me to go uh, to Penn State, but I didn't get accepted to main campus. And hence, I ended up at uh, West Virginia. So um, it, it was a good experience uh, overall. Well, you're a journalism grad. You started your career as a, as a sports writer, really into sports. I know during that time period, Penn State had West Virginia on the schedule often. It was during the, the great tenure of Don Nealon down there at yes. West Virginia. And I know Don, Coach Nealon and Coach Paterno were actually friends. Well, and this turned out to be, uh, it was great that uh, West Virginia had Don Neal, and I was there when he first came to the school and he had great success. But the bad part was um, when West Virginia um, kicked the crap out of Penn State in the biggest uh, loss that Penn State had ever suffered. Yes. It was like 63, 24, something like that. Major in house, right? Eighty-eight. I had to speak to the, uh, the um, board of trustees that following week. And my boss, Larry Cody goes, when I introduce you, we're not going to say that you went to West Virginia because people still have a bad taste in their mouth from the game last week. So, uh, which I thought was pretty funny. I mean, considering that Penn State beat the crap out of West Virginia for like 40 years. I mean, I, I think it was the first time uh, West Virginia had won in over 40 years. I think it was our first, maybe our only loss to West Virginia, uh, Wonderful West Virginia team that year. Major Harris was their star quarterback. Um, and I think they ended up going on and competing for a national championship. Yeah, they did. They lost in the national championship game. He actually took them to two national championship games. That's, a, that's amazing. So you come back to the Philadelphia area as a sports writer uh, for five years. Talk about that experience working in um, local, covering local sports. Well, I actually started when I was 15 uh, writing. And then when I left uh, West Virginia in 1982 was the worst year you could possibly have graduated because interest rates were sky high, 10 major papers folded. The Philadelphia Bulletin, which was the major evening paper in Philadelphia, offered me a job and then folded two months before my graduation. Wow. And so I ended up working for a weekly paper in my hometown called The Village News. 
I used to say I was a village idiot because I started working for $60 a week and then he raised me to $120 a week. And just so people know, even back in 1982, $120 a week was uh, still like as if I was working during the depression. And uh, I worked for them and then I got hired by the local daily paper to be a features writer. And I uh, wrote uh, features and covered uh, crime, working in the police beat. And then one day I got uh, asked to cover a murder on my girlfriend who became my wife's 21st birthday and realized this is insane. I don't want to be doing this forever. And that's how I ended up getting out of uh, being a full-time journalist. Now, since then, as you mentioned, I've written six books. I read a national column for American City Business Journals. I've written for Jim Cramer for two years at the week. I wrote for Forbes. And so I've utilized that journalism degree and, and ability to communicate. And my degree is in actually broadcast journalism uh, to do uh, both those things. But I love the sports rating. I did not want to be following my father's footsteps and be in business and have those crazy hours. But once I realized the hours and the pay were bad uh, for being a sports writer and a features writer, I had to adjust. And especially if you, we were looking to get married and have a family, I needed to think about a different career. So you say broadcast journalism. Those are the early days of ESPN. I'd imagine at that point you had a choice, right? Do you go into the broadcast side and this budding new cable a sports television or in a different direction? And you chose to go down the serial entrepreneur route. Walk me through what's the through line from sports writer to serial entrepreneur? Well, the tr truth is I would always been a serial entrepreneur. Uh, even when I was in college, I, I started a bumper sticker business. When I was in high school, I took over the high school paper and it usually went to the valedictorian or salutatorium. So I always had a flair for uh, making money. And so that's how I ended up becoming an entrepreneur. I always had a creative mind to come up with new ideas and then launch them. And that still uh, works for me today. And I didn't go into broadcast journalism. I did have a show when I was at West Virginia with a partner uh, for CBS called Profiles. And I felt I didn't have the radio voice. He had that deep voice. And I felt like I didn't have a voice uh, for broadcasting at, or I had more, like they used to say, a face for radio. And I decided that probably wasn't the route for me. But ironically, I ended up 14 years on KYW News Radio in Philadelphia doing uh, entrepreneurship uh, reports uh, for 14 years every single Sunday. And they said they liked my voice because it was different because I didn't have that deep voice from the well. So that's why uh, I ended up in, in as an entrepreneur is because I like the creativity of it. I like starting things. I like writing the plans and launching them. And as you could see from the introduction, I've been pretty prolific at it. And I love working with entrepreneurs. I work with entrepreneurs literally all over the globe. I was uh, saying uh, before this started, I'm working with someone in Peru. I'm working with someone in Sweden. I work with people uh, throughout the country, uh, helping them figure out how to build great businesses. So what is it about the entrepreneurial process that you enjoy the most? Is it an idea that solves a problem and then trying to launch a company around that? Is it kind of the, the growth to growth to sale? What is it about um, the ecosystem that you're most passionate about? I like solving problems uh, and, and I'll give you an example. One time I was on an airplane uh, going to teach at University of Monterey and I read this six paragraph story in Forbes that said, if you had a business bank account and your bank account ha got hacked and your money was stolen, that the bank wasn't liable. And I got off the plane, I called a president of mine who ran uh, a bank in the Philadelphia region uh, named Chris Annis, who's president of Meridian Bank. And I asked Chris, and that dot time, that wasn't really a subject that many people really thought about. And he said, oh, I think the PID, uh, the FDIC insurance covers it. But it turns out the FDIC insurance only covers your account if the bank goes under, goes bankrupt. So I started looking for insurance. Nobody uh, had an insurance product to insure small business bank accounts against cyber theft. And so I wrote a plan for it, started and got funded by uh, a company out of San Antonio called Argo Group, a New York Stock Exchange company. 
And that's always been kind of my thing. Uh, I started something uh, called Funding Organizer, and I had helped uh, five companies get bank loans. And every time I went to help them get a bank loan, I dealt with 15 banks. I would say, isn't there a place on your website I could click and file uh, and uh, fill out an online application? No, they don't have such a thing still to this day. They don't. Then I would say to them, well, can you give me a list of all of the questions you need answers to? Because what happens is, is that the loan officers, after they get a, a fill out a PDF form and you send three years of tax returns, they go, okay, we're interested. And then it takes four to eight weeks for them to collect all the information because every day they're asking for a separate piece of information. So I said, that's just insane. Uh, it should be much more efficient. So I created fundingorganized.com and we're just now talking to banks about using this as a common app for people to apply for uh, commercial loans because at the end of the day, there's no entrepreneur that wants to wait or business owner wants to wait four to eight weeks to find out if they can get money, they want the money now. So with our system, they could do it as fast as a day. So again, that's, uh, I, I like the idea of solving problems and I'm intellectually interested in lots of different things. I'm right now working on a plan for a metaverse entertainment center and I've got a team of people I'm working with around the country, and we're looking to raise money for that. Excellent. So you, um, we know you were the first executive director of the Penn State Technology Development Center in Great Valley. Um, you, well, let me reset there. Um, you were the first executive director of the Penn State Technology Development Center in Great Valley. Uh, you grew from one company to 53 companies um, and led the nation in minority startup companies while you were there. This sounds like it was the precursor of the Penn State launch boxes. Can you talk a little bit about the Technology Development Center and the work that you were able to launch there? Sure. Um, we were in the very early stages of business incubators. I had said to my boss, you know, we should focus on women and minority started companies and he was like thrilled because he said Penn State would love to be able to say they're a leader and I said I want to lead the whole country in that and we actually ended up doing and we created the concept of the virtual incubator because we ran out of space and people wanted access uh, to the services and so I created this concept of that you could pay $500 every six months and come to our educational seminars, access our advisory board, all of those things. So we had the space and we had, and somebody donated all the furniture for us, which was uh, really cool. And we had this great advisory board. And then we had lots of other people who wanted to get involved and help these companies. And, you know, one of the companies that came out of our center was Turner Investment Partners, which grew to 27 billion in assets. And that came out of our incubator so we had some pretty amazing companies. Scientific software tools came out of it. They ended up being bought uh, by the American Diabetes Association. And I think um, all the administrators got really excited because we were uh, dealing with really fascinating, interesting companies that came through that center. And they also took on a lot of interns uh, that worked with them. So from an early uh, stage, Penn State could see that the future was in entrepreneurship and helping these companies get started and leveraging the Penn State network, which Penn State was great from the campus to the main campus. They were incredibly helpful uh, to these companies, especially all the researchers that we were able to access uh, throughout the Penn State system. And I'm forgetting there's a group, is it the, it's something called the Farm and Something group, that, or at least it was when I was there at Penn State. And they were able to open a lot of uh, doors as well. And when we needed help with legislators in Harrisburg, Penn State has a big uh, office in, uh, in Harrisburg, and they were able to open those doors as well. So in so many ways, uh, Penn State has made a huge contribution. And when I was at Penn State, I had started uh, the Pennsylvania Private Investors Group, which was the country's first formally organized investor angel group and Penn State really got behind that in a major way and then when I left to start the Eastern Technology Council they were gracious enough to say 
let's have you still work with Penn State, but you can take that with you and take it to the next level. So Penn State was actually the father of uh, the angel groups that you see proliferating throughout the planet. If it wasn't for Penn State, that never would have happened. Yeah, speaking of uh, other angel groups, you were also involved with the Angel Venture Fair. Talk a little bit about that experience. So the Angel Venture Fair this year is in its 25th year, and we bring together entrepreneurs with wealthy people to invest in their companies. And if you go to angelventurefair.com, you can see videos about this. But we deal with entrepreneurs in every field with the exception of retail stores and real estate investments. But everything else is open and of interest uh, to investors. And we get investors from five states that come to our big event. Our big event is June 22nd, which is the second time we've been live since COVID started. But we also do now a lot of uh, Zoom events, and that's worked out well. And we do a lot of educational events to teach entrepreneurs how to pitch uh, to investors. And most of the investors themselves were entrepreneurs. So there's, it's different than when you're getting money from a venture capitalist, where most of those people come from financial backgrounds, some from entrepreneurship, but most from like MBA programs uh, and were in banking or, or some form of finance, where the angels typically come from the same background you do as an entrepreneur raising capital. They're more patient about what needs to happen, more supportive. Uh, it's really great. But the Angel Venture Fair has um, companies typically from 20 to 30 states that end up applying and maybe three or four countries. So we have a global footprint. It's interesting. Um, I once heard we are involved here at the Penn State Alumni Association with 1855 Capital, um, which is a which is a venture fund uh, aimed at helping startups uh, around that actually are born out of Penn State, either from students or faculty. Um, and it's interesting how your investors come from five states and your startups come from 30 states, right? Uh, what, yeah. what they told us at 1855 is investors want to invest in things within 60 miles of where they are. You could probably draw a circle around it. And it's because they want to keep an eye on their investment. Well, they also like to get to know the entrepreneurs. And so that's that's really important to them. But now, because they got so used to the pandemic and doing things virtually, that meeting companies through Zoom works for them now. They're able to go and see these companies. They all might fly out or they will partner with another angel group that's in that particular area. You're seeing a lot more syndication deals. When I uh, wanted to expand and start the American Private Investors Group and have uh, private investor angel groups all over the United States, uh, people thought I was insane because of what you just said. Who's going to invest in a deal in Los, Los Angeles if they live in Philadelphia? But now, of course, 30 years later, that's pretty commonplace. But it took about over 20 years until that became the case. And I had started like a second in the Baltimore, Washington area, but was not able to get it to take off because people just didn't see into the future and probably because the technology wasn't there to uh, make that connection. And now, of course, you have the Angel Capital Association, which brings all of those folks together also to help do deals. So we talked earlier about um, your passion as a writer and how you've transitioned that passion, written six books, some of which have made um, the bestseller list in, in the business category all around the entrepreneurial uh, mindset and helping entrepreneurs kind of grow, um, grow their businesses, grow their, grow their companies. Um, you've taught at Wharton, you've taught at St. Joe's, you mentioned Drexel. Well, when was it, I, I know you mentioned that you've always wanted to help people throughout your career, but it seems like there was a, a shift in, in being more intentional about that. And, and in particular about helping other entrepreneurs go down the same journey that you've been on? Well, I think that's uh, from my working at Penn State from 87 to 90 when I started the Penn State Technology Development Center. Uh, I really enjoyed the idea of helping these companies make connections for them with strategic partners, investors. I mean, I was 26 and everybody who came through the door was way older than I, I am. 
And in fact, it's kind of a fallacy. Most people think that all these entrepreneurs are like Silicon Valley TV shows where they're all 28. But the fact is, the vast majority of entrepreneurs are typically between 40 and 50 years old. And so what they're looking for is introductions on people that can invest, people who can partner and sell their product or service. Uh, they're looking for advice about, you know, what's the best way to pitch. And for the longest time, uh, women did have a problem raising capital because men who were the vast majority of investors, that's not the case today, were afraid that if a woman got pregnant, what would happen to the company? And then women basically showed that they could juggle both uh, without a problem. In fact, we had a, a woman named Joan Sampson who was representing her husband and his partner uh, wanting information about getting into our incubator or using the virtual incubator. And I re still remember seeing her in this brown sweater holding a baby who had just kind of thrown up on her sweater and she's collecting this information. And over time, Joan actually became the CEO and they ended up working for her. And they actually sold that company for a nice chunk of change uh, to a company called Grease Monkey. And they had developed software for all the Grease Monkey uh, locations. So that was a big success. And Penn State can take great pride in the fact that that company also came out of that uh, incubator. So I think, you know, the things that uh, we were able to go and do and form a live advisory board, it wasn't like all those incubators back then were typically real estate plays. They were you rent space, you had access to a fax machine, and that was essentially it. We went way above and beyond uh, trying to make sure that our entrepreneurs were successful. And I have to say, I felt great every day I was able to help these companies and still do. I uh, do coaching for the community college here in Philadelphia, working with startup entrepreneurs. And I love the enthusiasm and I love hearing about their um, businesses. I'm intellectually very interested in hearing about uh, what people think are good ideas and how they plan to launch them and then trying to connect them with the right people. This is the People of Penn State podcast. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined today by Mark Kramer. He's the president of The Best Business Minds. Speaking of The Best Business Minds, it seems like in 2020, um, as the pandemic hit, the number of podcasts that were available exploded. Everyone everyone became a podcaster, right? We were all at home um, We and, and found this, I don't want to say this new, medium, right? Because podcasts have been around for more than more than 15 years. But you launched your Best Business Minds podcast. First, what was the thinking behind launching the podcast? And then uh, if people aren't familiar with it, what is the format and what could they expect to hear if they tune in? Well, it's kind of an interesting story. Uh, two weeks into the pandemic, I thought, you know what? I want to connect with uh, the entrepreneurs that I deal with, my own clients, uh, I uh, not only write business books, but I read a lot of business books. And I thought, wouldn't that be interesting to bring, do a live Zoom cast and interview the author and allow the audience to be able to ask questions. And, and initially we let them actually ask the question getting online, but that became unwieldy. So we told them, you have to type your questions into the chat. So I asked a friend of mine who taught at Wharton, now teaches at Harvard, Dr. Laura Hung, who wrote a book called Edge, which is basically overcoming adversity. And I called her on a Thursday and I said, Laura, would you uh, be interested in being my very first podcast? I'm calling it the best business minds. And it's going to be a live Zoom cast. When do you want to do it? I said, tomorrow at noon. And she goes, tomorrow at noon? That's not even 24 hours. And I said, yeah, uh, I'll send out a blast email. I mean, people aren't really doing anything. And she said, well, maybe we'll have 25 people who want to listen to this. We had 172 people sign on. It was crazy. And after I got done, people said, when's the next one? So for the first six months, I was reading two full books a week, doing two shows a week on a Tuesday and a Friday. But that that became crazy. I mean, to keep up with reading all those books. So my Essentially, I read the books, I put uh, together a list of questions, I send them to the author uh, the night before so they can tell me if there's questions they want to add or subtract or there's not something they're not sure of. And then we do it live. Now, when I did not know was that podcasts were typically very rarely ever live. Uh, 
Right. And so I started doing these interviews and then all of a sudden authors were contacting me and I had best-selling authors and they were reaching out to other authors. And I one day asked, uh, this may be about uh, two months, three months into it, I, I can't believe how many people want to be on this show. And so one of the authors said to me, yeah, because you're doing the only live show. They said, podcasts aren't live. You do the interview at some point, you edit it, and then you put it up there. You doing a live show and interacting with the audience. Well, that's great. Well, now we're booked through February of 2023. So every single Friday is already booked. And essentially, we go from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And uh, I start off with an introduction about it. I start off with a few questions. And I tell people, when you have questions, just ask them. So unlike other people who are doing interviews where they basically go through all their questions, and at the end, they go, oh, we have time for two questions. I let the audience ask questions from the beginning. So if I'm three questions into the 30 questions I put together and I start getting from the audience, I ask every single audience member's question. And when they've run out of questions, then I go back to my questions. Well, they love that because they are actually involved in it. And so now I have uh, listeners from 62 countries, which blows my mind that there are people from 62 countries right. that like to uh, listen to this show. And like a good referee, I kind of stay out of the way. And the author is the star. I always hate these interviews you see on TV where the interviewer does all the talking and the person being interviewed does very little, which I have to say, you are very good at interviewing because you basically put the questions out there and then allow the subject to answer them. So I think it's great. Well, I, I appreciate that that compliment. You're also adding value as you go along by, you're adding value to your listeners, right? By having the listeners get the questions that they want answered, right? I'm attending this because I want to know this. You're instantly adding the value that they're looking for. Oh, I mean, I have to say, I ended up uh, being on the board of a company in Spain, another company in Sweden. Uh, I've gotten clients from it that I did not expect to get. So it's had a lot of benefit. Now I'm even looking at monetizing it by doing this as a service uh, to companies that have lots of business owners that they deal with. You know, So it, it's turned out to be an amazing thing. But what's most been most amazing about it was I had to be disciplined to read a book every week, so I'm learning stuff, but I'm humbled literally every week by the high degree of intelligence of the people that I bring on. I, I had a, a young man, and I'm forgetting his name now, but he's head of MIT's AI lab. And how intimidating that when you read his book, the forward in the book is written by the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the chairman of Google. Now, what does that say about this particular individual? And uh, I, it turns out I got very popular with Harvard professors who not only have come on the show, but have asked to come on a second time uh, for the show. Same with Wharton professors. But we basically have books from all over uh, the world. I've interviewed authors in China and Italy and France and uh, the UK. So they've literally come from everywhere. And they're so excited about being on the show. and talking to the audience and talking about their books. It turns out I have a monopoly that I never wanted uh, or tried to establish that nobody really ever set up a podcast to focus on interviewing business book authors. But 67% of my audience are C-suite people and 93% um, are C-suite and 67% are CEOs themselves. Wow. Wow, that's, that's amazing. If people want to get more information about the best business minds, where can they find your podcast? So you can go to, of course, www.thebestbusinessminds.com. Uh, you can also write to me at mkramer at thebestbusinessminds.com and I'll send you a link. We have a, a show uh, tomorrow with uh, on Friday with Nova Lorraine, uh, who wrote a book on how to maximize your potential. And it's a fabulous book. And I curate all these books. So I look at a lot of books before I select the 52 that I'm interviewing during the course uh, of a year. And so that's been really interesting. And publicists love it because they get a, uh, their authors get a ton of exposure. And we also send links to 
everybody that they can go buy the book. And a lot of people are telling us as the show's going on that they went and bought the book as they're listening to the author. That's amazing. Mark, at the end of the People of Penn State podcast, we like to have a little bit of fun. We call it our lightning round. So I'm just going to throw some quick hitter questions at you. Sure. You, um, talk about the first thing that comes to mind. Your favorite class at Penn State? Uh, acquisitions. How about the favorite? your favorite company that you've launched? Favorite company that I launched? Uh, scientific Software Tools. Um, if you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? Well, if I could bring my father back, that would be really awesome. I would, I miss my dad. He died uh, 16 years ago. Um, but it would be Queen Elizabeth. And for the simple reason that she's been uh, the reigning monarch for 75 years, which is like incredible. But the amount of knowledge she must have about leadership, about people, about governing, has got to be probably nobody in the history of the world has ever had it. And no one has ever had to go through the things both on a personal level and a professional level and keep her dignity and, and keep it all together. I mean, you just right. don't see this woman breaking down. I mean, I think it will be a huge loss to the British people, but certainly to the world the day that she actually goes because she essentially kind of holds us all together in a sense. She would be a, an amazing podcast guest. Yeah, oh, my God. It would be <laughs> awesome uh, to be able to talk to her. How about your most unusual we are moment? Maybe a place where someone yelled we are or you yelled we are and kind of caught you off by surprise interacting with another Penn State. Yeah, I saw somebody wearing a Penn State backpack uh, when I was in Lima, Peru. And so uh, we are and they turned around and it turned out to be um, a travel group, you know, through the Penn State uh, tra uh, alumni travel program, uh, Paul, That's that amazing. we run. And so that was that was pretty cool. That's amazing. How about your favorite Penn State sport? Oh, easily football, like all of us, right? I mean, I, you die, live and die with uh, Penn State. I like the coach. I think he's done a really good job. I would be surprised if Franklin doesn't uh, win a national championship at some point. But I really uh, love the football and have been pr proud of the program, you know, what they've been able to accomplish, not just in – the game itself, but the graduation rate uh, was always high. Joe Paterno, I think, of Division One coaches, he was always the leader yeah. in uh, graduating, the having the highest graduation rate. So I think I'm I'm proud of that. They can do both. And finally, your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream? Oh, uh, mint chocolate chip. <laughs> That's a popular one for sure. Yeah, I really like it because it's so. It, uh, your taste buds come alive uh, when you're eating that. And of course, you got to go to that creamery, right? I mean, right. I also like Rocky Road as well, but that's an internationally known uh, place uh, for ice cream. That's like a must stop, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Mark, we want to thank you for joining us on the People of Penn State podcast and allowing us to share your story. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to seeing it. I want to send a special shout out to our producer, Vincent Longaro, and our guest relations coordinator, Mara Ryan, for uh, helping us pull together the People of Penn State podcast. If you like this episode, I hope you'll subscribe to the People of Penn State on your favorite podcast app of choice. Help us spread the word. Share the podcast with your friends and with fellow Penn Staters via social media, and always tag the Penn State Alumni Association when you share it. If you're a member of the Alumni Association, thank you for your support. If you're not a member, what are you waiting for? Go to our website today at alumni.psu.edu, and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thank you for listening and for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are... Well.